All right, we're Jesus' popularity at this particular junction is growing uh, significantly. We're moving up quickly to the time that he goes to Jerusalem. And so his popularity is continuing to increase. And he's going back to Judea now from Galilee at this particular time. Um, large crowds, that's one thing we see here. Crowds around him. Um, like I said, his popularity here continues to increase. This isn't the point where, his, where he started to decrease in popularity or where people started to turn from him. So he continues to increase. This is after the, reach, after the raising of Lazarus, chronologically, we're right, basically right after the raising of Lazarus here. Um, once again, they're going to talk to him about marriage and divorce. It seems to be a recurring issue in Jesus' ministry, doesn't it, uh, this question? Uh, something he brings up a lot, something he's questioned about a lot. Um, so it's a, it's a big thing. But once again, you know, some of this we have to kind of take a first century perspective when we look at it, some of what Jesus talks about here in Jewish law and how Jewish law applied. And it has a lot to do with application of law, doesn't it? Um, you know, the reason we have lawyers is because obviously we don't know how to read the law. Am I right? I mean, we're always finding another way or a loophole or a, right? I mean, if law was straightforward, laws were straightforward and could be understood without interpretation, we really wouldn't need a lawyer. Am I kind of right about that? You know, lawyers, to a large extent, judges, lawyers, courts, they don't just uh, enforce laws, do they? They uh, interpret law. Am I right? They interpret law. What does law mean? What does, uh, what does a law, how does it apply? Is there a way around it? Is there a law that trumps a law, right? And if you have enough laws, eventually that kind of happens. And in the case of of the Jews, when Moses came down off Sinai, he gave them a, a way to divorce, to give them a certificate of divorce. That's something we never really see in the Bible until the law. I and mean, it's not something we ever talk about in the Bible until Moses comes down from the mountain. It's not something that's really a thing. Because I think before that time, uh, it wasn't really women had very little say. I think men could put a woman out and it wouldn't really matter. I mean, I don't think that there was, I don't know they had a lot of say in it. You know, does that make any sense? And a lot of what the law, we always look at the law, Moses' law as being so hypercritical. Um, so many laws, so many rules, so harsh it seems like, doesn't it? Sometimes the law of Moses seems very harsh. But in a lot of ways, Moses' law was extremely was really extremely righteous and extremely, in that society at the time of Moses, it was very protective. There were a lot of things in the law that really set Israel apart from certainly the Egypt that they came out of, absolutely, and certainly the nations around them. For instance, Moses said, when he came down off the law, when he came down to the, the law, says an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, essentially, right, means that what? The punishment fits the crime. Well, in that society or in those days, that didn't, didn't happen. I mean, if you were a rich man and a poor man did something to you, you could just have him killed, right? I mean, you didn't have to, you know, you, you, it didn't matter what he did, right? If he did something bad, if you had authority, if you were in Egypt and you were the Pharaoh and somebody didn't bow the right way, he could just have him killed. Nobody was going to say anything about that. Kings could do that. Look at Esther. She said, if he doesn't extend the scepter, I'll be killed. Right? There's not a lot of righteousness in that, not a lot of justice in that. So Moses essentially said, listen, I don't care who you are, rich, poor, whatever, the punishment's going to fit the crime. If you take somebody's eye, you, you might lose an eye, right? Um, in other words, we're going to make that even. He said, if, if you kill... Uh, if my if my animal kills your slave or whatever, then I'm just going to pay you the price of it, of that slave, right? 30 pieces of silver. I'll pay you the price of that slave. Or they, he put value on things, didn't he? They put value. They put righteousness. You can only be tried under the by, the, by two witnesses under the law of Moses, right? One witness could never convict you. Had to be by the mouth of two or three witnesses. 
that you were convicted. So there was a lot of protection under the law of Moses. So let's think about something else a little bit before we get into this discussion, because I don't think we have this discussion the way we should. We tend to look at this very New Testament, and that's okay. We're New Testament people. But let's think about from a Jewish perspective for a minute. So under the law of Moses, if you committed adultery, what was the punishment for adultery under the law? Death. Stone you to death. For one person or both of them? Both of them. So adultery was a very serious crime. Am I right? It was a death crime. Adultery was a crime punishable by death. That's as serious a crime as you can get. So when Moses comes down off of the mount, he brings this law with him, and he says, listen, let's, we're going to look at what Jesus says about it. Because what Jesus is going to, so let's, keep, let's just keep that in mind for a minute, and let's just read a little bit about what Jesus says here. Well, I'm not clicking. There I go. Some Pharisees came to Jesus. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reasons at all? And Mark says, uh, he answered them, what did Moses command you? And Moses said, you can give him a certificate of divorce and send her away. Okay, Moses said that. But Jesus said, because your heart is of heart, he wrote you this commandment. In Matthew, he says, from the beginning he created them male and female. And he says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his to his wife, they shall become one flesh. They're no longer two, but one. What God has joined together, let no man separate. We hear that. Of course, we generally look, think of it in King James, don't we? Uh, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. It says in the King James. That's generally how we think of that verse. Um, and he says, uh, so he kind of brings it up. So, he, he, so Jesus starts his argument um, because their argument was the law. What did, what did, what did they say? Well, Moses says you can receive the divorce. So Jesus begins his argument from that perspective, right? But then he goes ahead of Moses. Let's look before Moses. Okay, the, Moses brings down the law. Let's go all the way back to Adam and Eve. We're at pre-law, okay? What, what happened in the beginning? Well, God created him man and woman, right? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, that she'll become one flesh, one flesh. So Jesus is saying, let's look ahead of the law. Let's just go to the law. Let's look ahead of the law. What was it in the beginning? Pretty straightforward. Man and woman, one flesh, married, pretty straightforward. So then he says, uh, why, why, then they said to him, why didn't did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, because your heart is of heart, Moses means you divorce your wives. From the beginning, it's not been this way. And then he says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And Mark, he says, the disciples began to question him in the house. And he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. If she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. Now, you just told me what the punishment was under the law for adultery. Right? Death. Am I right? So if Moses had said, you can't get divorced for any reason, then basically, as soon as one of them left the other one, and was joined to another person, they would be stoned. Does that make sense? Because it was punishable by death, you see. So God said, all right, I'm give you an out clause. Give them a certificate of divorce. Then when you do that, you're not committing adultery. So it gets you out from underneath that. Because if you didn't do that, then when marriages would dissolve, which marriages are going to dissolve, God knows that. God's not ignorant to that fact, right? Then when marriages dissolve and they would have went the other way, they could have been killed because it would have been adultery. So you see, that's pretty big, that's a pretty big thing under the law to be able to get out from underneath the death penalty if you left your spouse, right? But what's Jesus? That Jesus says from the beginning it wasn't this way. So what changed? 
you see. Well, until the law, I wasn't punishable by death. Adultery wasn't a, wasn't a sin. There wasn't sin until the law. So before the law, it really wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't that people didn't get divorced before that. Certainly they did. But after the law, it became a big thing. Because if you did it then, it puts you in a state of punishment. Because the law imputed sin. You see? doesn't mean God ever approved of it, even from the beginning. It just means that when the law came down, there had to be something in there to make it doable. Because it's going to happen. Okay? It's going to happen. We know that. So, it was a big question to them. And in Jewish thought, there were two rabbis at the time of Jesus with two vastly different opinions of what this meant, this reason for divorce. Now, in this case, it says, except for immorality. Well, it's kind of a difficult word in the Greek. But the truth is, is that there had to be a reason, in other words. Um, so we talk about that. You know, what's the reason for divorce, biblical reason for divorce? Well, the big question about divorce is not really the sin of divorce, right? Is it a sin to get divorced? Um, yeah. Um, is it a sin for a lot of things we do? Yeah, right? Yeah, go ahead. Right, when you remarry, yeah. But in yeah. Right. Yeah, like Gary said, there's a biblical command to not withhold from your spouse too. So if you so if you divorce them, obviously you're breaking that command. So because you are withholding from them. So you know, is there sin involved in this process? Absolutely, right? The only question you have to, the question inevitably that's been raised over the years is, you know, is it a continual sin? In other words, um, that's always been the argument. Is it a continual sin? In other words, if you divorce somebody and married another person, are you continually in a state of adultery? The only way actually to get back in God's grace would be to go back to your original spouse. I don't know that I want to get in a huge, long conversation about this this morning, but my short answer is no. Uh, my short answer is we live in a state of grace. It's not a continual sin. Divorce in the Bible, however it happens, for whatever reason it happens, the word divorce in the Bible means an absolute separation. We can look at that word in the Greek. It means an absolute separation. So once that occurs, there is no longer a relationship, regardless of the reason that happens. And since that relationship ceases to exist, then the, although there can be a sin committed, it's not an unforgivable, it's not the unforgivable sin. It's really funny. I think this is kind of funny. Maybe y'all might not think this is funny, but years ago, Bill Green, not, not our Bill Green, but his dad in uh, Okima, he was teaching a class one time. He says, if I ever get where I don't want to be with my wife no more, so I'm just going to kill her. And they said, uh, how come? He says, well, the church will forgive you for murder, but they won't forgive you for divorce. <laughs> so, so, you know, that, that's, that's probably some truth in that, right? So, uh, but it kind of illustrates the point, you know, kind of illustrates the point. Um, but I don't think, you know, Jesus holds up a lot of ideals, and we should strive for that ideal. I'm not saying we should. Marriage is important. Yeah, go ahead, Corky. Well, the Bible kind of speaks of that. For one thing is, if you're not a Christian, I think the rest of it doesn't matter. I mean, if you're not saved, you're not saved. It's irrelevant. But if you, right, but if you become a Christian, Paul says if the unbeliever leaves, you're not bound. 
So basically, Paul says, if, if you're a Christian and your spouse isn't and they decide to leave, um, which, of course, at the time Paul wrote that, you've got to have some context, context in there. I mean, becoming a Christian, especially if your spouse was a Jew, they could leave you for that. I mean, that would be realistic. Um, right, but he says you can stay. Yeah, Paul says you're better to remain how you are. Is basically what that scripture says. But he says, if they leave, you're not bound to them. Oh, well, I don't think that, you know, I think once again, I think you stand in a set of grace on that. I don't think you can, I don't think you can be held accountable for you know, I don't think, especially if you didn't even know, I don't think you could be held accountable for that. I just. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't catching it. I'm sorry. I was trying to keep up. I was paddling hard, but the dinghy wasn't moving. Here. Yeah. Yeah. But marriage is important, and I think in God's eyes it's important, and I don't think uh, that should ever be downplayed in the church. Um, I think that, you know, that's something we should try to save our marriages if we can, especially people in the church. We should strive to give them resources to save their marriage if they're in trouble, and we should definitely teach our children. And I think maybe that's you know, maybe that's our downfall more than anything is teaching our children the sanctity and the, and the value of marriage and the longevity of marriage. You know, I think, and I think that's hard to do to 16 or 17 or, well, I shouldn't say 16 probably, but, well, I know my sister got married, she's 14, but uh, to an 18-year-old or even a 20-year-old or maybe a 25-year-old to understand. I think looking back, being married 40 years, which some of you here have been married longer than me, but been married over 40 years and I you know looking back I don't know what I knew at, at 18 you know certainly didn't know what I should have known but um you know we muddled through right so um but I think marriage is in trouble in the church so many times we don't know it's like Gary says you know we don't know we don't know to the boat sunk you know we don't know we don't get in and help because we don't know people don't want to talk about their relationships or their problems and but as a church, you know, there's resources available, and, and we even have paid to have people go to counseling, professional counseling. So, I mean, we're, we're committed to saving marriages here. Um, I think that's the point I'm trying to make. So, and I think we should be. I think that's a, as Christians, I think we should be committed to that. Yeah. No, I don't think that's right. <laughs> yeah. No, no, right. Yeah.
Yeah. Right. I had a really good friend of mine, and I was an Arkansas preacher when we were down there, and me and him, and his wife and Susie were real close. They were both hairdressers and opened up a hair shop together and worked together, and um, I just thought, absolutely thought the world of him, still do, great guy. And um, we had this conversation, I don't know, many, many years ago, you know, 35 years ago, and uh, he said, you know, he said, well, heaven forbid, if something ever happens, I get divorced, he says, uh, he says, I'll never give up on God. He said, because heaven's too important to give up. And um, he did get divorced. And I, I don't know anything about the situation uh, or anything else, but, but he did get divorced and did remarry. And, uh, and he's still standing in the pulpit. I mean, I, you know, I, he, um, and he, you know, I know his heart. I mean, I know the heart of that man. And he, uh, you know, that's something we talked about many, many years before it ever happened. But like I said, so because it's something that, you can get by in the Lord. I mean, abs I think absolutely. You know, I think God's grace is great. And, you know, I don't think we can, and I don't think that we can, uh, you know, I think for us to stand up and judge any situation or relationship or any failure relationship as, as men is, is wrong for us to do. Our job is to preach the gospel and teach the truth and love people. And I think that's what we need to do. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, teaching our kids is a huge thing and marriage counseling before people get married. I think that's a that's a good thing. I never did it. Um never even considered it when I got married, but um, uh, I think it would have been beneficial <laughs> in hindsight. If I had to do it again, I would do it, um, but at that time, I didn't, you know, but I would if I was to get married again. If I was to go back and relive that, I would, I would definitely, uh, I definitely would have went to marriage counseling before I got married, without a doubt. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Oh, you don't know how deep God's grace is, Tom. You're 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 baptized in God's grace. You have, you know, the grace of God is beyond comprehension. We don't, and the forgiveness of God is beyond comprehension. You know, the forgiveness of man is limited, but God's forgiveness is is uh, unfathomable. You know, if we're repentant and true in our heart, uh, God, you know, God's going to give us away. And I think. Um, and unfortunately, I wish, I hate it when people say, well, I heard that or a preacher said that and I, you know, and I've served them sermons. I mean, I have, and I, and, um, I've, and I'm sorry. I mean, I don't know what gives a man, any man a right to stand up and say some of the things that men say. Um, I know I don't have the right to say them and, uh, 
things fail in life. We fail. I mean, marriage is no different than other things we fail at. I mean, we fail. Yeah. God knows that. I mean, I fail every day. I mean, you can't take one sin and say, oh, well, that's, you know, God can't forgive that. And well, Why? You know, God forgave Paul. Paul was a murderer. Paul persecuted the church. God forgave him, didn't he? God, Paul was ready to go meet the Lord. Paul knew he was that way. Peter denied the Lord, didn't he? Peter denied him. Right there, just, doesn't the Bible say, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you for my father was in heaven? Well, Peter denied the Lord three times. And yet Peter knew that his soul was secure. Peter knew that God could forgive him for that. You know, I've heard that argument my whole life. Well, I'm, I'm such a sinner, God can't forgive me. That's nonsense. That's nonsense. God, you're negating grace. You know, you think about, think about David and uh, when David sinned with Bathsheba. How bad was that? How bad was that? I mean, that was so bad. That was bad on every conceivable level you can imagine, wasn't it? I mean, it involved deceit. It involved adultery. It involved murder, right? I mean, there's everything you can possibly think of in that story. That's as, just as bad as you can get. I mean, I don't think you can get any worse, right? And when Nathan shows up to talk to David, and, you know, David's kind of gone on with his life. I mean, I don't know how David did that, you know. But David had kind of gone on. And if you really read that story, when Nathan shows up to David, David's the king of Israel, king of Judah, king of all Israel at that time, right? What I just say, the law says, if you commit adultery, you should be stoned. Did David commit adultery? David should die. Am I right? Isn't that right? David should die. This isn't a, this isn't a maybe. This is an absolute. I don't care if he's the king of Israel or not. David's supposed to die. Nathan shows up, exposes David's sin. And then Nathan says, if you read the passage, Nathan says, the Lord's forgiven you, you shall not die. Right? Is that grace, do you think? Don't you think that's grace in the Old Testament? People say, you can't find grace in the Old Testament. Don't you think that's grace in the Old Testament? When God showed up and says, you sh you're not going to die? I think it is. I really do. How deep is the grace of God? It's deeper than any sin you can possibly commit if you repent and come back to God. And you can't take divorce and put it on a pedestal and say, oh, well, that's the one he won't. That's stupid. You can't do that. Man can't do that. Yeah? So what? It's a mistake. Yeah, we sin. Yeah, we need to do everything we can to save our marriages. I totally agree with that. We need to teach our kids the sanctity of marriage. I totally agree with that. But sometimes, in spite of everything, marriages fail. I come from a divorced household, you know. Um, it's just how it is. So, does God not give us a way back? Sure he does. Absolutely he does. Why wouldn't he? Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think Gary kind of, you know, that's something Gary talked about too, you know, that's something we need to teach, you know, what does it mean to be a Christian husband, what does it mean to be a Christian wife, there, there, God explains a lot of that, probably should pre- teach some sermons on it, I guess, but God goes into a lot of that, you know, what does God expect of me as a husband and as a father, and what does God expect of Susie as a wife and a mother, there's expectations, and as God's children, we should strive to live up to that expectation that God's put forth. So, you know, and we need to know what those expectations are. Maybe we don't talk about that enough as much as we should. So maybe that's true. There's a lot of great truths here. We serve a divorced God, do we not? God divorced Israel. So we serve a divorced God. So God understands the premise of that. Um, but I think that it's a... Uh, the disciple said to him, if it's this way, kind of what, what Tom says, if it's like this, and you just shouldn't marry, right? I mean, if that's the way it is, you just shouldn't get married at all. Because if you don't get married, you can't fail, right? I mean, basically, right? But, and there's, I guess, logic in that, you know. Um, Paul says, you know, it's better to remain as I am. Paul wasn't married, and Paul didn't I guess want to be married Paul says if you can remain as I am that's fine but if you don't have that self-control then you need to be married Uh, most people obviously don't have that self-control but um, but Jesus doesn't agree with that uh, because marriage is something God set forth it's the way God intended to populate the earth to procreate Um, there's religious grounds godly grounds for marrying if God didn't want man and woman to be together I guess he wouldn't have created woman for man so, I mean, there's a godly premise to being married. Um, and he said, not all men can accept this statement, only those has been given. And then he kind of explains that. He says, there are eunuchs who were born that way, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who made themselves eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. So, in other words, there's people who don't have that desire. Some people don't have it because that's how they're born. Some people don't have it because somebody did it to them. Some people don't have it because they decided to make themselves that way. Um, we don't talk about that much in our society. I don't know that people ever make themselves eunuchs in this society, but at the time of Christ, that was something that happened. There were a lot of eunuchs. Um, and a lot of times people in power, like the Ethiopian eunuch, when they were serving under a power, a king or queen, they would, they would castrate them because they knew that that would make them more loyal to the cause, um, take away their, a lot of their desire. So, um, Jesus kind of says, yes, sometimes that's how it is, but it doesn't have to be that way, right? That's a decision you have to make uh, in your life, uh, that decision. Paul says, either way, you're okay. If you decide not to be married, that's okay. If you decide to be married, that's okay. Paul says, either way is okay. So, um, some people can decide not to be, live their life alone or whatever, that's okay if they decide to do that. Some people do that for God. That's okay, but they don't have to. Um, so he, Jesus kind of puts it, kind of ends it with that idea. Um, are there any more comments? So he goes on to the children again, and this is another time that children come up to him. This is getting later in the ministry, though. We're in Matthew 19, Luke 18 here, getting towards the end uh, of these Gospels. Uh, more children coming to him. We see this in all three Gospels. Um, here he put his hands on them, laid his hands upon them. Uh, says, if you do not receive the kingdom of God like a child, you will not enter at all. He took them in his arms, blessing them, laying his hands on them. The kingdom belongs to such as these, Luke says. It's an interesting time. I think Jesus and the children, I think it's something that really warms our heart. Um, In a society that largely overlooked children, Jesus embraces them. Um, I like the physical aspect of it. He actually lays his hands on them. He actually embraces them. Children are important to him in and I think it's an illustration Jesus uses, and we've talked about it before, about having a childlike heart, um, what it takes to, to have the faith of a child, the faith to see heaven. And Jesus uses that illustration. Uh, 
Uh, so I think it's really interesting. I've, one of the children, uh, historically, uh, there's a, actually was one of John's, if you've ever heard of my history, Bible history, uh, you'll know, recognize the name Polycarp. Polycarp was a, was a student of John, the Apostle John in Ephesus towards the end of John's life. And one of our early church fathers, we call him, or the, that uh, we get, have his writings. And traditionally, uh, Polycarp was said to be one of the children here that Jesus uh, put on his knee. Now, whether or not that's true or not, but that's a early church tradition is that Polycarp was actually one of these children that Jesus, that Jesus dealt with in the Gospels, which would be quite, quite interesting if that's true. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's church tradition. So uh, maybe some of those children went on to do great things, right? Um, we would hope. Uh, Jesus um, um, dealing with them. You know, I think the story of the rich young ruler is a, is a story that uh, we spend a lot of thought or have spent a lot of time and a lot of thought about. I know I have. Um, it's one of those questions. It's it really the question is to me is fascinating. I think it's about three times in the gospel we have somebody that actually asked Jesus a question directly. What does it take to inherit eternal life? Which for a Jew is an astounding question because, like I said, most Jews didn't believe in eternal life to start with. So it's kind of really a fascinating when they approach Jesus with the question itself. We don't think much about that question. To us, eternal life is something we just understand, but. Most Jews didn't, so it's kind of interesting when the question's posed. Um, and really, I think, as with many times, when people come to you and ask you a question, they're not really wanting an answer as much as they're maybe wanting validation for what they're doing. Do people ever do that to you? Or they might come and ask you something, but they're really not asking for your honest opinion. They really just want you to validate what they're going to do or what they've decided to do. And I think in this case... It's kind of that idea. Uh, the ruler's looking for validation in his life. He's not really looking to change. I don't think that was ever really his intent. His intent is to validate his right to eternal life as a Jew. And he's rich, and we talked about that. And in Jewish thought, that means he's blessed. So in his mind, he's one of the blessed of God. He, God's blessed him in this life. He's blessed him with riches, and because of that, he must be a fairly sinless person. Uh, right? God's blessed him, and so he's pretty happy, I would think, as a Jew. You know, I've got this blessing, man, I'm living right. God's blessed me. I must not have much sin. Um, you know, uh, here's Jesus, this rabbi, this teacher. So I'm going to ask him. You know, I'm going to get some validation that, you know, God really had, and I'm going to get eternal life. And I really think maybe that's his mindset when he comes to Jesus. And Jesus... Uh, and he addresses him that way. If you look at it in Matthew and in Mark, he says, uh, he says, good teacher, right? Teacher, doesn't not Savior, not Messiah. Uh, rabbi, right? Teacher. Um, why, why are you asking him what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments, Jesus says. Uh, no one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Uh, don't murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. That's not everything, but it's kind of the big list. It's the A list, right? So he gives him the A list, right? And the rich man, he's feeling pretty good, right? He says, I've kept all this from my youth, right? Um, I think it's interesting if you look at, uh, if you look at Matthew, Matthew says, uh, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? You don't see that in Mark and Luke, but you see it here. And he says, uh, and the young man said, he says, I've kept, what am I still lacking? Teacher, I've kept these things from my youth. Mark's my favorite gospel. That's one reason I like putting gospels up side by side. That's why I kind of like doing this study. Uh, because I love Mark. You know, Mark is short, but Mark says things that nobody else says. Uh, I don't know why, just maybe his perspective. Um, but only in Mark does it says, if you look at 21, it says, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him. I love that in Mark, right? Mark's the one who really says, why Jesus? He, he loved him. He felt a love for him, 
right? Compassion is maybe the bigger word, maybe the better word. Felt compassion, right? Um, because he knew he was lost, you see? Um, and because of that, he, he, he felt that. And, and, it, and I guess if the, if the ruler had just left it at that, he would have went on his way and everything would have been fine. But here he says, uh, one thing you lack, give away your wealth. You know, it really must have took the wind out of that guy's sails, didn't it? I'm sure it did. Had to have. He couldn't wrap his head around it. Says he was saddened. He was saddened, but he didn't change. He was remorseful, but not repentant, wasn't he? Um, I can't do that. Of course, we understand the sin wasn't in the wealth with this man the sin's evident right here the sins that he wouldn't give it up right uh the sin wasn't in the wealth the sin was in his reliance on the wealth he had the savior of the world in front of him and yet he trusted in his riches instead of in christ that's the sin you see could have been anything but that was his sin and he owned much property, it said. He was extremely rich, it says. What if Jesus said, give away half? Think he might have done that? Think he might have did 50%? But you know, like I said, the problem wasn't the amount of money he had, right? The problem was that he trusted in his money, you see? We have to be careful about that as Christians. We learn to trust in ourselves. We learn to trust in a lot of things. But in the end, we need to put our trust, we need to put our faith in Christ. Because the things of this world will never get us to heaven. Right? So, it's a great lesson. It's a great lesson. I've often put myself in his place, in the rich man's place. I don't think I'm extremely rich. I don't think really monetarily I'm not rich at all, but... But um, I've often put myself in his place if Jesus said, all right, just interesting. Jesus is right there, right? Not a hypothetical. Jesus is standing in front of him. says, give it up and follow me. I don't know. Tough call, wouldn't it be? Hard. That's a lot of faith, isn't it? That's a lot of faith. Especially for a man who doesn't see Jesus as a Messiah yet. Just sees him as a rabbi, sees him as a teacher, doesn't he? A lot of faith. More faith than he had, right? Thanks for your time this morning.